welcome to Eureka. I am Gohar Raza and you are watching Eureka. 24th January 1966, there was a plane carrying Dr. Omi Jahagir Bhaba, one of the most outstanding scientists of the country. This plane met an accident. The news came and it spread like wildfire. The whole nation mourned the death. There was a family near Meerut in a small village. The family did science and therefore mourned Dr. Homi Jahangir Bhaba. Ten-year-old young child in the family was intensely affected by the discussion that was going around. Everybody discussed how Dr. Jahangir Bhaba had transformed the Indian scenario, how he had contributed to physics and nuclear energy and nuclear technology. His life after this incident which intensely affected him was shaped by science. He decided to contribute to science. Welcome Dr. Tyagi to Eureka. I would like to know that what are the memories of that day that still haunt you? If I recall it correctly, uh, we have been living in a village. Although my father served in the city, but the whole family uh, was a united family. And he so was in irrigation department. In irrigation department as canal magistrate. So we used to live in the village and uh, uh, I and your mother was a housewife. A housewife and she also lived most of the time in the village. So I, I have uh, done all what farmers do today on the field in my childhood and also used to attend a school. Now my brothers have been largely from physical science area and uh, therefore I, I feel that these things must have impacted me. First, that my connection with the field probably made me interested in to look into the life of the plant. And uh, second... No, I was talking about Dr. Baba's death, yes. which is still... I, I'm coming to that. Right. And the second, that how did I shape my ideas? And uh, for that I recall that uh, when I was 10 years old and uh, we heard of the death of Homi Baba, uh, the family coming from the physical science had kept him in very high esteem. And so we started to dis discuss what are his contribution to the nuclear program, to the policy of the nation, and so on and so forth. And then I started to read that how he has contributed while working at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, and then established uh, Baba Atomic Research Center, which was named later on, on his, uh, his name, and his contributions for basic as well as applied sciences, and simultaneously also for the national policy. So these all things, uh, we discussed and then I read and possibly that initiated me to take up this career because by this we can serve but the science nation better. anyway you would have uh, taken as a career because your father was your role model, your um, uh, siblings, your... the house was a house of science probably. Not necessarily because you will see uh, that uh, all the people while they were in the physical area uh, I have taken biological sciences. But that so probably to, has to do with uh, <laughs> your father as, as a role model who was in irrigation. You were very close to the agrarian uh, atmosphere right, that was... Right, So that's that the thing. So the science village. I could have taken. Uh, I don't uh, uh, go away from that fact. But my shift from uh, other areas to biological sciences was possibly... Uh, my attachment with the field science and also at that uh, service time, to the nation. Yeah, at that time, physics was held in real high esteem. And agriculture was not the in thing for a bright child like you. Right. So, how difficult it was for you to take the decision that others have gone into physics, I will go into Now, for, for this, if you will consider, uh, in the beginning, we start with science and coming to the plant science happens quite late. So up to graduation, we have been studying biological sciences, chemistry also along with it. 
and then we go to the plant science. So if you say exactly when I shifted to plant science, what happened? Essentially, I was a student at Meerut and I went to Dehradun. And then in that trip, I was exposed to the forest areas in that and also I talked to some of the teachers in Dehradun. And that made me take the final decision that I will go to study the plants. Uh, after you came to Meerut, it must have been a major change in your life. Yes. Right, from village to Meerut to Delhi University and then to Germany. Which one was the biggest change in your life? I would say the biggest change was <clears throat> from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Meerut to Delhi. Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, at, by that time, the infrastructure in the institutes was not that good. When we came to Delhi, uh, then uh, we were exposed to the best possible institution in India and the best possible teacher in the area of plant science, Professor S.C. Maheshwari, who is quite famous. So that was the biggest change. And also the areas of research changed from, from typical plant, it went into the study of cell genetics. So we have to learn technology as well as new science together. Now, when I went from Delhi to Germany, the interesting thing was that because we had a good teacher and I had to move to, from cell genetics to molecular biology, but Professor Maheshwari ensured it that all of us are aware of the background of molecular biology. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Germany, it hardly took any time. As a matter of fact, I'm happy to say that theoretically I was probably even better than German students. Although practically we never had the chance to touch those uh, advanced instruments and so on and so forth. But, but theoretically, theoretically, you were, we were as good student. as any German student, student who was trying to do yes. postdoctoral fellowship. I have to take a break. Don't go anywhere. We'll come back soon. Welcome back to Eureka. We were discussing with Professor Tyagi how the cultural shift affected him when he came from Meerut to Delhi. But in Delhi also, you were not very happy with the, with the facilities that you, you had for your research at that time. Um, so, uh, when you became uh, a senior scientist, did you ensure that similar feelings are not harbored by your uh, students? Well, I, I should say uh, in the beginning that we had facilities to do cell genetics. But mm -hmm. in that period, molecular biology was getting in. So all the facilities for molecular biology was not there. When I returned back to Delhi University from Germany, we started a department of plant molecular biology. Right. And in that we ensured that the modern facilities for students are there. And it is now in the India. Best of the facilities. Best of the facilities. And it is now considered as one of the premier department in India and is internationally known. Same is true for the National Institute of Plant Genome Research. So now our students and scientists have those facilities by which they can internationally compete. And we are also able to update them uh, regularly so that we are at the cutting edge. And this change everyone has felt in science in the last 10 or 15 years that right. opportunities have improved. In the entire country and so is the yes. case with right. plant molecular biology. Uh, when did you uh, start working on rice? Where your contribution has been um, recognized by everybody in the world? I, I started uh, to work on rice right after I joined Delhi University. At that time there was uh, a debate that whether Why we was should there this, this special interest in, I, in I will rice? Tell you. There was a debate that whether we work on the model plants or we work on a plant which is relevant to India. So what, after reading a lot and after looking at the circumstances, I took a decision that probably we can do basic science of high caliber, even with a plant which will be relevant. And therefore we try to combine good science with uh, the possibility of use of that science for the common people. And in that situation, rice, uh, became the plant for investigation in our laboratory. One in four person on planet Earth and uh, depends on rice, right? That is what your paper says. And one, 33% uh, of 
total calories that are consumed by Indian uh, comes from rice. Now, in this situation, rice becomes important, which people may not know, but scientists would surely know. Was there also uh, this reason that the genome sequence or the gene of the rice is much more simpler as compared to, to wheat and, and other things that we consume? Well, let me say uh, that rice genome sequencing was an incident which happened, but it could happen because we were prepared. And since we were already working on rice for about a, a decade or so, we, we got a call from uh, Department of Biotechnology. Dr. Manju Sharma phoned me and asked, can India We have already do interviewed in our program, Dr. Yes. Manju Sharma. Yes. Can India do rice genome sequencing? And we uh, thought we can do it. And that was the first time that India entered into an era of high throughput genomics and we delivered the sequence on time. Along with this, it is true. Was it for the first time that genome was, uh, was that that the high throughput delivered? genomics was done? No in other India. country had done it. No other countries have done, but India had not participated right. in such a program. So India took first step into high throughput genomics through rice genome sequencing, and we delivered it along with ten other nations which participated in this. Now, world community decided on rice to work first because of its economic importance and simultaneously because the size of its genome is only about 400 million bases. Now only about a week back, India has also uh, declared uh, wheat genome, which is about 40 times to that of rice. rice. So yes. in this period, the technology has advanced too much and the cost of sequencing have also come down. And therefore, one can approach today wheat genome. In those times, wheat genome would have been a difficult task. But remember, whether it is 400 MB or 16,000 MB, the plants, both rice and wheat, are the pillars of food security for India. Your institute is uh, part of 14 institutes across the world. Uh, which are which are uh, doing research on rice itself, and uh, 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 we are almost at par with any other country. It was initiated by Japan, if I if I am correct, but but other countries have started participating, and India is one of them. Do you think that if we do good science, then others respect and share their knowledge with us, and we can also understand their science? and develop our science. Without that, there is no future. This is true. While for rice genome sequencing, 14 laboratories across the world participated, now we have hundreds of the laboratories taking advantage of the information which was generated in rice genome. Now, and some of the big multinationals. Some multinationals also. Very along big with giant it. multinationals. Right. So, uh, we get an advantage because of this collaboration that we can know the information even before it is published. And we can develop our program along with the world programs rather than waiting for the information to cut, come at a later stage. And as we produce... And if we don't do good science, we can't even understand the information understand. that That's comes true. to us. That's true. So, so we, when we produce this work, then automatically recognition comes. Our scientists are now invited for international conferences. Last year, India hosted international rice functional genomics meeting in here in which about 100 scientists from outside came of their own uh, to participate. So that shows the strength uh, which India is gaining now, into this now area. Coming to, to something very, very uh, simple. Uh, this research, we are part, of, part of, and parcel of international uh, consortium and people exchange information, etc. How does a farmer get benefited when you do genome research? Look, this is kind of a relay race. We do genome sequencing. We define the function of those genes and then scientists in India from agriculture institutions have made use of this information to combine together better traits. This has already happened in India. You know that for flood uh, uh, prone areas, there is a variety release. So you can, if you understand gene, then you can develop specific varieties, varieties. for a specific areas. And farmers get the package in the form of a seed of an improved variety. 
and this is this has already happened remember that if by this technology we can produce even 1% more it means 1 million tons of rice and 1 Huge million tons amount. of rice will cost about 2000 crore rupees so those are the dimensions when the varieties are grown at a larger scale and we also have limited area yes. where this this any any crop can be cultivated that area cannot be expanded so within that area you need to expand the production and for that in today's world without understanding gene and their functions you can't increase probably the yield i would think so i would think so moreover besides this limited area we should also feel that about two third of our area is rain, rain fed and when rains are not there then the yields go down now this genomics also tells us which genes can help these plants survive in a water deficit condition so it will improve cultivation of rice with less water even on those areas so this potential exists and is being explored so today without doing high science and knowing the molecular level of things how they function without that you cannot see a better future for any country i have to take a break don't go anywhere we'll come back Welcome back to Eureka. We were discussing with Dr. Tyagi. Now you have a situation where the pressure on land is increasing. We have more mouths to feed. And in a country like India, where there's so much of variation of environment, unless you understand a crop at gene level, you cannot probably improve its yield. But a lot of people criticize that ultimately this research is going to benefit the big multinationals. How do you reconcile with that? We are doing research, we are spending public money on research which is taken from an individual citizen of the country. And if it benefits someone else, then there is a problem. I think this is a myth. Let us understand that genome information does not stand alone. It stands and it helps the breeder to produce better varieties. So breeding and the genome will come together and therefore we will have genomic assisted breeding. That's one. Second thing is that information in the hands of scientists from public institutions would ultimately strengthen both the public sector and also the private sector. And we should not see private sector also as enemy of the society. They are very much part of the society. And we see that how IT has been helping uh, Indian uh, level of uh, development. Similarly, biotech industry could also help. But I agree that uh, being a country like India, our public sector institutions are also working to make use of this information and making these varieties available. As a matter of fact, two of the Indian institutions have already gone in this direction and provided variety to the farmers. So we cannot say that it is only one-sided. It will provide information to both sides and then both sides can compete to provide uh, both kinds of uh, the, the, the society where we have to support them from the side of the government funds and also the industry which need to prosper in order to make our country proud. Yeah, there are complexities, very many complexities involved with that issue, but we can take it up uh, at some other point. You have made a very interesting comment in one of the, your papers that tomato and potato are gene cousins. Yes. Yeah, they are very different for a common person. How do you say that? Uh, we, we, along with the rice genome, we also participated in tomato genome sequencing. And potato was also done by other laboratories. So we made a comparison. They both belong to one family mm -hmm. of, of the plants. And although the fruit which we eat are of different types, but the fact remains that their genome is made up of more or less same genes. There are only about 600 genes which are quite specific to tomato, vis-a-vis -vis that of potato. 
but it is the variation within those genes which makes potato stand as potato <laughs> and tomato stand as tomato. You will be surprised that 10% of our genes in our body are similar to bacterial genes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm sure some of the people who are listening to this will get evicted and will stop believing in Jat Path uh, yes. because uh, we, we belong to same gene pool and uh, there's hardly any difference between human beings. Uh, but it's amazing that a, a slight change in gene gives you one product which is ultimately potato and the other is tomato which are very different, which That's look true. very different from each other. Now, once you are the director of uh, one of the most uh, prestigious institute in the country, that is National Institute of Plant Genome Research, which is again located in Delhi. Uh, do you think that the money that's being spent on research in India is going to place us almost comparable to international community of scientists? I, I have no doubt that we are comparable uh, to uh, the international uh, scientific but to community. But maintain that standard. But to maintain that, that and also raise our bars, we need more investment. But the fact is that uh, the institute, uh, for example, uh, NIPGR by its own has sequenced one complete genome of desi chickpea, that is chana. And that's where we demonstrated that these biological satellites, not only we can make biological satellites, but we can even launch them by ourselves. Because the whole work has been done by a team of scientists in NIPGR and complete genome of Chana has been sequenced. So it is possible. But more investment will improve the quality and help us keep in the front line. That brings you, uh, uh, me to, to a very, very important question. China has tripled its investment in, in as uh, percentage of GDP uh, in science and technology, but our investment has remained the same over a period of time. In 1999, they were behind us and now they are much ahead of us. So do you think more investment will bring more uh, fruits we are looking in China and we will be lagging behind? We are looking at this whole scenario as a challenge as well as opportunity. Challenge because we do not have as much investment as China and opportunity because we want to remain in the forefront with this and therefore we will have to think in an innovative manner. So we have to bring some focus in our research, we have to organize our activities in such a way that we can do relevant science uh, and also combine it with the discovery science. This we have to do. But Look, if we make these comparisons, there is no doubt that a better investment and also activation of industry into the research area uh, would certainly be helpful and give uh, better dividends for Indian science. Uh, now, uh, you have been outstanding scientist personally. Getting 20 awards is no mean thing. Your research, your contribution has been recognized by the peer groups. Have you, has it given a boost to your uh, work? Has it excited you? Or you would have done what you have done even without these recognitions? I would say that a lot of energy for doing good things comes from inside. And if that work is recognized, then certainly it boosts the moral and not only of individual but of the whole group and that makes them produce more. So this whole process remains a pursuit of excellence. We try to do better and as we reach that level, we raise the bar and continue in our pursuit. Would you argue that scientists in the country should be recognized more? There should be more um, maybe awards for them? Uh, more opportunities for recognition by the general public, which does not really happen in the country. I, I should say that uh, if people know that there is a scientist, the scientist as such is respected quite a lot in the society. But when we look at uh, the awards, 
these give more visibility to a person first in the scientific society as a matter of fact. And I would say that awards should not be only the, the individual, awards should be combined with such kind of associated rewards which help the science progress. For example, grants along with the award if they are put together, then they will make the person do better. So those uh, new ideas we should try while rewarding the work of scientists. It has been lovely uh, talking to you. Would you like to give some message to the younger generation? To the younger generation as a teacher, I would always like to say that very first thing they have to do is to study a lot. The science is a challenging area, but it is also a self-satisfying area and also brings a lot of rewards. So choosing a career in science is always a better option. And this is not, I am saying that only because I have <laughs> Because it. you are a scientist. A scientist. But it is true. But it is not for everyone, but those who have this capacity should take the challenge. And after taking the challenge, two things are required. One is that there should be a perseverance. One should persist in a particular area and raise the level of knowledge in that area so that you are in the front line and you are able to help the society. The second thing is that you should consider the journey in science as a pursuit for excellence. There is no stop point in this. And therefore, you have to continuously bring new information, new knowledge, combine it, and then produce uh, new facts and by your investigations. So this is a very wonderful area to pursue. And I would like that more and more young people should join it. And they can, in turn, help the society much better than mm any other profession because a output from science has much larger impact on the society as such. If you want to make an impact on society, do go in for science, but then the journey is not very easy. You have to have perseverance. Dr. Tyagi, it has been just wonderful to it's have my you pleasure. here. It was very nice. We will come back next week with another scientist who has contributed to the pool of knowledge. For now, it's a goodbye.